Sing it out this morning. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? For who can stop the Lord? For who can stop the Lord Almighty? For who can stop the Lord? For who can stop the Lord? Well, good morning. We're so glad that you chose to attend church with us here at Victory. Um, right now, if you want to uh, greet one another and say hello, uh, we'd love for you to do that.
continue to worship the Lord this morning. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested in my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains, and my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your From my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested in my criminal's cross and darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose without freedom in hell that's when death was arrested in my
thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all he paid it all jesus paid it all all to him i owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow
God, we're grateful that you are our treasure, that we can come to the altar, that we can lay our sins and our burdens down before your feet. Father, today as we move into this, uh, move into the message, God, I pray that you would speak to us right where we're at. I pray that you would break down barriers in our hearts, God. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, kids can uh, line up over here by Kyle uh, and go to Children's Church right over here by the Lighthouse. Uh, you may be seated. All right, very good. Wish we all had a little more of that energy like these children, don't you? It's a wonderful time for us uh, to be able to be together, and uh, we're grateful that we can offer this time for your children as well as we gather here in the Lord's name. I was <clears throat> listening to the lyrics of that song wondering how many of us truly embrace the message of that song that we just sang where it speaks of God's arms being open wide for us. A lot of times we find ourselves questioning whether or not we can really embrace the idea that God is open to our coming to Him. But when we look at it from a biblical perspective, we begin to understand that what the Bible tells us is that there is this continuous invitation that comes to us from God. And the idea that it's the blood of Christ that opens the arms of God is an incomplete understanding of redemption. Because before Jesus ever came and offered himself as a living sacrifice on the cross that we might be 
declared righteous. God opened his arms and let Jesus come to us. And that's why we're here today. Uh, We're here to celebrate as we share in the Lord's Supper what God has done for us. We're here to celebrate what God is in the process of doing for us. And we're also here to remember that God is delivering us from so many things in this world and also so many things that are a part of our past and so many things that we're struggling with even in this moment. And so it's important that we not lose sight of the fact that God has offered to us this invitation with open arms. And it's so amazing that we sing about that, but it's more amazing that we would embrace that and recognize that with every act of love, God is opening his arms to you and to me, and he's saying, come, come home, come here where you belong. And so as we come to this time when we gather together around the Lord's table, we do so to remember, and not only to remember, but also to proclaim that this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to be able to tell the world of his goodness and his desire for us to embrace that goodness. Find with me Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, and we're going to spend a few moments here today as we prepare our hearts uh, for the time that we have at the Lord's table this morning. And let me say, as you're finding Romans 8, and uh, the scripture will be on the screen, but uh, Romans, of course, you turn to the New Testament, the four Gospels, and then the book of Acts, and then the book of Romans. And so we want you to find that where you can follow along and You can see as well as hear as we share this moment in God's word. So um, I want to let you know as well that if you are a believer, a follower of Christ, uh, we welcome you and we invite you to celebrate with us today as we share in the Lord's Supper. So uh, sometimes You may be from a a tradition where only church members can participate. We want you to know that all believers, all followers of Christ are welcomed today at the table as we celebrate this time together. But hear these words that God inspired and that Paul has uh, written for us in his understanding of who Christ is and who we are in Christ. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. What then are we to say about these things? The things that Paul has just described in the verses previously, where he tells us that God has justified us, made us right with him through Christ's uh, sacrifice. And then he says, if God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him, that being Christ, grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect, the saved? God is the one who justifies. He is the one, uh, who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God, and he intercedes for us. I love that promise, and I wish we could see that and would would hope that you would keep that in the forefront of your mind every day as you're going through some of the challenges of daily life. Who then can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us that being Christ. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Let's take just a moment and be still before the Lord and give him thanks for what he's done for us. And would you bow just for a moment and ask God to prepare your heart for this moment with him. Father, we thank you for this time and we are grateful that you've invited us to your house to worship you through song and through prayer and through thoughts and through actions today. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to hold on to the amazing gift of life that comes to us through the Lord Jesus. Thank you for reminding us today through your word that there is nothing that can separate us from the love that you have for us and expressed in Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray today. Amen. The question is, is asked sometimes as we come before the Lord and the Lord's table, why is it that we are gathered here at the Lord's table today? It is a time of celebration. It's a time when we come together as the family of God and we celebrate all that God has provided through the gift of his love for us. In some ways, it's similar to um, a Thanksgiving gathering. Uh, now, I know that some of you are going, well, the last time we got together on Thanksgiving wasn't so good. Now, I know sometimes things don't always go great at Thanksgiving celebrations, but it does remind us a little bit about what we're experiencing and how God is, is ministering to us at this time. You know, sometimes uh, the turkey gets burnt and things, don't, things just don't go well. And sometimes that's the way life is for us. And sometimes when we come to the Lord's table, maybe for you today, this week has not been a good week. And as you come before the, the Lord's table today, you're going, man, I just don't know if this is a time for me to really try and celebrate the love of Christ, the love of God that is found in Christ that was extended to me. Can I remind you again, think about the open arms of the Lord, his open arms for you that we sang about just a few moments ago. It's what he has done for us. It's a reminder that even if we've been gone for a while, maybe we've been distanced from the Lord for a while, just like at the Thanksgiving table, we're, there's a place for us. There's a place for you today at the Lord's table. And it's so important for us to understand that. Because here's the thing that we need to understand this morning. We need to recognize that why we celebrate and why we proclaim this act as a part of our worship is so that we remember what God has done. We have a tendency of only wanting to focus on what we've done to determine whether or not we're worthy to be here at the Lord's table. But when you take a very close look at the scripture and you begin to understand what God is saying to us, and what Paul has been inspired to say to us here, you begin to recognize that it's not about what we've done, but it's what, about what we've allowed God to do in our lives. And so when we come today, when we hold the bread and we hold the little cup, two elements that remind us that Jesus literally died for us, his body was broken to pay the penalty for our sin, his blood was shed to seal us to the promise of God, it's not something that can be broken. It's a matter of what God has done for us. And therefore, Paul asks the question, if that is true, then who can be against us? What can be against us? And some of you are allowing yourself to take a mental uh, survey of where you've been and what you've done, and you're saying, Brother Chuck, if you just knew what has gone on and where I've been and all the things that I've been a part of, you would say that God has no desire to be with me. And I would say to you this morning, you were wrong. And you say, well, how, you, how do you know that I'm wrong? I know that you're wrong because, listen, God doesn't sit on his throne in heaven and say, that's number one sin, that's number two sin, that's number ten sin. What he recognizes is that we all sinned. And we've all come short of the glory of God. We've all fallen short of his calling and his purpose in our lives. And therefore, it's not a matter of what I've done, it's a matter of what I'm willing to allow God to do to transform my life. If God is for me, then how can my sin and the actions that I've taken, how can they 
be against me. And that's what Paul, in the leadership of the Holy Spirit, wants us to understand this morning. And so we ask ourselves the question, uh, why do we take this little piece of bread that doesn't taste good? In fact, in our first service this morning, one of the little guys, first time here today, and uh, I was asking him about <clears throat> his experience, his dad and mom, and we, we had a time together after the service this morning. He said, man, that bread doesn't taste good. I said, you're right, buddy. But you know, it's, it has a connection with what God is wanting us to know. There are some things in our lives that probably don't taste very good to us. But when the Lord Jesus washes us and cleans us, it's a different thing. It's a completely different picture. It's a completely different reality. I love the illustration that Mike used last week of looking in the mirror. Because here's what we need to do. Every day when we get up and look in the mirror, what we see is what we are becoming, right? But from a biblical perspective, we need to recognize that when James was talking about that, that in James chapter 1, what he was wanting us to see is that when we, as a result of what Christ has done for us, begin to look in the mirror, I need to see less of me and more of Jesus. And that's so important when we think about what God has called us to do here today. That's something that can really... It resonates with us when we think about the Thanksgiving meal because quite frankly when we gather with big family gatherings at Thanksgiving sometimes we're going you know this would probably be a better day if so-and-so wasn't here today right now I'm not going to call any names because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings but the reality is that there's someone sitting across the table from us that's going hey it would be a better day if Chuck wasn't here right but here's the reality of that. You can't pick your family, right? Now, you can choose your friends, <laughs> but the reality is you don't choose your family. You're born into your family. And the truth of what God is saying to us about what Jesus did for us is that we have been born into his family. John chapter 1 the scripture tells us very carefully and very pointedly that as a result of our belief, our trust in the Lord Jesus, we've been given the right to become the children of God. We become. It's not something that happened through human process. It only happens as a result of God working in us. It's what Jesus has done. And how did he do that? He did that by laying his life down freely for us. And so when we come to the Lord's table, it's not, it shouldn't consume us to be thinking about why we shouldn't come. Rather, it should consume us with the understanding that the reason we're here is because of what Jesus has done. And he continues to invite us. In fact, here's what Jesus says over and over again to us. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How does that happen? How is that possible? It's only possible because Jesus took your burden on himself. The burden that separates us from God. Not from the love of God, but from God. And when we think about it and we see the picture in our minds that remind us of Jesus laying down on the cross, his arms spread open wide, why is that? so that he can take my hand and the hand of God and through his sacrifice reconcile us. And as a result of what Christ has done, I am now a new creation. Yeah, I may think about what I was, but the amazing thing about the scripture is we have a tendency of always looking back. The scripture always tells us and always instructs us to look ahead. In fact, here's what Jesus said in Luke's gospel. No one placing their hand on the plow and looking back is worthy of the kingdom. Now that's a hard saying, isn't it? It's a hard saying for us. 
But the reality is, what Jesus is saying is, don't let what's behind keep you from experiencing the full measure of what is ahead of you in Christ Jesus. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, I don't pretend to make you think that I've arrived, but what I do is forgetting what's behind, I press on toward the goal, which is Christ Jesus before me. And here's what God wants us to do. God wants us to continue to focus on him. So as we come to the Lord's table today, we remember what God has done for us through Jesus. But we also remember and we proclaim what he is doing in our lives, how he is changing us, how he's transforming our lives. The wonderful gift of coming to understand who God is is to recognize that God never changes. The scripture over and over tells us that he is the same as he's always been. He's eternal. He does not change. The theological word for that is he is immutable. He cannot change. But here's the beauty of God not changing. He becomes the change agent for us because he begins to work in us. All who are in Christ are a new creation. The old has passed. The new is come. Paul would then say, Work out the salvation that is in you. It's what God has already declared. Now we just need to understand it, embrace it, and allow it to become our reality. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does that mean? It means stop thinking about the past. Start thinking about the future, knowing that you have been redeemed. And you're in the process of being transformed by rather than thinking about all the bad in the past, thinking about all of the promise that is in the, for, in the future. Because this is what God has done for us. And this is what God is in the process of doing. And then we think about the fact that as we gather and as we <clears throat> hold that little wafer in our hands and that little cup in our hands, between our fingers, we need to be reminded that God is delivering us. So Paul says, what can separate us? If God is for us, who can stand against us? No one, nothing. If God is for us, who can be our accuser? Who can bring accusation against us? We need to understand that Satan is the accuser, but Jesus is the judge. And he's already declared the verdict. We have been forgiven. And we are free in Christ. We are a new creation. And then he says, if that is true, then is there anything or anyone that is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ? Dr. A.T. Robertson, who is probably one of the four most Greek scholars ever, says that this is an understanding that we should have about this passage. He says, can anyone put distance between Christ's love for us? The answer to that question is no. <clears throat> and then he says, well, maybe we should think of it this way. Can anyone lead Christ to cease, to stop loving us? The answer is no. And you say, well, Brother Chuck, how do you know that's true? I know that's true because of what we studied about two weeks ago in John chapter 5, because what we learned there is that Jesus revealed to all of us that he and the Father are one, and he simply said to us this truth, I can only do that which the Father shows me. Well, what is it that the Father has shown Jesus? When he turned to Jesus, opened his, uh, his arms open wide and said, Jesus, it's time to go. Go and free my people. He learned it, he saw it, he watched it, and now he is fulfilling what he has seen. Therefore, we understand that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And Paul gives us this little list. He says, can death? And the answer is no. 
Why? Because God raised Jesus from the dead. He defeated death. We have no reason to think that we would be separated by death because death has been defeated. Can life? No, because God is the author of life. He is the giver of life. He controls life. There is no life outside of him. And so his promise, that which he has given to us and made available to us, can never be taken from us. Can angels? Absolutely not, because they are the servants of God, created only to serve him and at his authority, under his full authority. Can rulers of the world? Absolutely not. You say, well, Brother Chuck, how is that? Because God, according to Romans 13, has appointed all of them. Now, I know that sometimes we question that, scratch our heads and wonder what in the world God's doing. It's none of your business what God's doing. Just be careful what you're doing. I, I, I'm sorry, I just want to say that today. It's important that we understand that. Can present, can the present? No, because God is Lord over time. <laughs> there is no time or space that God is not. He's there. And he's reminding us, I've got this. He's over it, controlling it. Can height? No. Psalm 139 reminds us that God is everywhere. He knows you better than you know you. He knows everything about you. He's so intimate with you and loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you and to deliver you from all your past, from all your past sins, from all your sins today, and all your sins tomorrow. When Jesus died, he paid for every sin. Is there any depth? No. Again, Psalm 139 says, no, nope. God is everywhere. Nowhere you can go that God isn't. And then he asks the question, any created thing? Well, absolutely not, because Psalm 19 reminds us that everything that has been created has been created to, to glorify God. And so there is nothing that can separate you or me or anyone else who has entrusted their life to Jesus. And that's why we gather at the Lord's table. It's a reminder of who we are as a result of who God is. It's a reminder of what God is in the process of doing as a result of who he is. It's a reminder of God's deliverance because we're being reminded today that God is up to something, something very special in each of our lives. Will we trust him? Will we embrace him and his open arms as he invites us to remember all that he offers as a result of his love for us? Take a moment and ask God just to prepare you for this time that we have with him at his table. And as you do, I'm going to ask the men who are serving today to make their way to the front. And they're going to prepare the table. And in just a moment, we'll begin to share this time of communion today. Bible tells us that on the night before Jesus was crucified that he gathered with those 12 that were closest to him during his days here on earth and during the meal he 
called attention to the fact that they were there to remember and to reflect upon God's deliverance of their people generations before. And then he called attention to the fact that what he had in store, what was to come after the day that followed, was that they would remember that it was his body. He is the lamb that would be broken. It would be his blood that would seal the promised gift of life from God. And so he took the loaf, something similar to this, unleavened bread. And the scripture says he prayed over it. And then he broke it. And he passed it to those next to him and around the table. And he said, take and eat. For I do this for you. And so we celebrate that today and we ask the Lord's blessing on the bread. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you today, God, thankful for an opportunity to come together as one body of believers. God, believing that your son, Jesus, died on the cross. And God, today as we partake this bread, God, I pray that you would uh, help us to reflect on the sacrifice that was made, the, uh, God, the, the, the death that occurred. But God, help us remember too and the hope of, uh, of Jesus' resurrection. God, we're thankful for day and we're thankful for this opportunity. God, just stir our hearts this morning. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit move through this place as we remember, as we partake the bread today. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, take and eat. Jesus then took the cup 
cup that was special in the celebration of the Passover because it was saved for the last blessing. It was the blessing of the promise of God, a promise that could only be kept by God's provision. Jesus took that cup and he called attention to it and he said, you've celebrated this cup of promise all throughout your lives. And what Jesus was really saying is, it's becoming today, it's being fulfilled today. This is the cup, he said, that seals the covenant of God's promise forevermore to all who will place their trust in the Lord Jesus. And so today we bless the cup as we are reminded of what God has done for us and as we celebrate the joy of his gift. today we ask that we would remember remember well what Jesus has done for us we thank you for his blood that was shed on that cross God for the fact that it has covered our covered our sins we can now experience forgiveness because of that precious blood like we sang in the song earlier God it's because of his forgiveness that precious blood that you've, you've given to us. So God, I pray that you would bless the cup that we drink and as we remember the sacrifice of what Jesus has done for us. He's atoned for us so that we can come back into your presence. Thank you for this blessing of Jesus Christ and for his shed blood. It's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Jesus said, take and drink. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand together and as we do, we extend to all God's invitation. That is to come 
as you've held the bread that reminds us that Jesus did die for us, as we've held the juice that reminds us that in that his sacrifice covered our sin. It's a very real way of reminding us of what God has done. And now he extends his invitation. And we would invite you to come, maybe to Jesus for the very first time and say, I need him as my savior. And we invite you to him today as your savior. Maybe today, as a believer, you would say, I need a fellowship, a church, where I can be a part of what God is doing. And if so, at God's leading, we invite you today to unite with this fellowship. Maybe this morning, as the men join me here at the front, you have a special prayer need. We would invite you to come and allow us to pray with you. Just in the next moment or two, as Joel plays. Is there one who would come just now? Father, as we depart from this place, may we go knowing full well that your spirit indwells us, to lead us, to guide us, and direct us in your work as we enter a field that is a mission, a field white for the harvest. May we lovingly do so in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you all for being here today. We hope you found this week's message a blessing in your walk with Christ. We would like to extend a personal invitation for you to join us for worship this week at our Victory Baptist campus. To learn more about our scheduled worship times and activities at Victory Baptist, please visit us online at vbcmtj.org. That's vbcmtj.org. Again, thank you for joining us today and we invite you to be here at the same time next week for the Voice of Victory.